Shalom. Welcome back. We're continuing on with our series, Answering the Skeptics. Uh, just kind of responding to different objections that I've heard with regards to the writings and the teachings of Kepha. And we're going to do things a little bit different this time. I've got four statements on the screen. And these are four statements that when somebody comes to me and they have an objection to the things that I speak about and I teach on my channel, almost invariably, they will speak most, if not all, of these four statements in the letter or the email or whatever it is that they send me. It's almost uncanny. You, you wouldn't think that diverse people from different backgrounds who don't know each other would all have these four common statements that they would say. But, uh, you know, taking into account that sometimes it may be worded slightly different, these four ideas are brought forth repeatedly by different people. They'll say you're ripping pages out of your Bible or you're, you know, tearing verses out or ripping books out of the Bible or whatever. They'll say you're picking and choosing what to believe. You're going to end up rejecting the whole Bible, or you're just going to end up rejecting Yeshua, or you're going to end up rejecting, um, you know, Yahuwah, or, or whatever the issue is. Or they'll say, you just throw out whatever doesn't fit your theology, or whatever doesn't fit your preconceived notions, or that sort of thing. <clears throat> and I think that these are all objections that really reflect something else going on beneath the surface. Because if you look at these, they're, they're really not objections to anything that I'm saying. Um, they're all objections to me. You're doing this, you're doing that. It's not really about the message, it's more about the messenger. And essentially it's just four straw men that this person is putting forth and trying to get you to, or trying to get me to spend my time arguing about these straw men. So we're going to look at these, look at what Kepha and Yeshua have to say about this understanding or this objection that people will bring forward, and it may reveal to us what's really going on behind the scenes. So we'll start with this one. You're ripping the pages out of your Bible. Now, for the record, I've got quite a few different copies of the Bible probably 20 to 25 different versions. Some are New Testament only. Some of it's just the Old Testament or just the Torah or just the Apocrypha. But I've probably got 20 to 25 different copies of the Bible. And not a single page is ripped out of any of them. None of the verses are whited out on any of them. Um, there's quite a bit of highlighting in some, some of these different Bibles I have, but I'm not advocating in any way, shape, or form ripping pages out. And in fact, I think that Yeshua actually recommends against this also. In the parable of the wheat and the tares, the servants of the landowner come to him and say, do you want us to go out and gather up these tares? And the, the landowner says no, because if you gather up the tares, you're also going to uproot some of the wheat with them. Now, I think this parable is about the falsehoods and the true things mixed into the Scripture. And you're probably thinking, no, 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 sorry. Um, it's, this is already interpreted in Matthew 13. When the apostles come to Yeshua and say, hey, can you explain this parable of the, of the wheat and the tares to us? And Yeshua says, yeah, the, uh, the good seed, these are the sons of the reign of heaven. But the tares are the sons of the wicked one. And so, see, this parable is not about true verses and false verses. This is about people. This is about good guys and bad guys mixed together. Now, I don't think that this is a correct interpretation. I think somebody may have added this after the fact to hide what the parable of the wheat and tares is actually about, especially if it was a church person, because the religious leaders don't like us questioning whether the scripture is infallible or not. I mean, it's a church doctrine, and they don't really, they don't really like for people to question church doctrine. So it makes sense to me why someone would come in and add this interpretation after the fact and say, no, it's about good, good guys and bad guys rather than true verses and false verses. 
And I think that the evidence is even in this chapter of Matthew, because if we turn back to uh, verse 10, it says that the apostles are coming to Yeshua and asking him, why do you speak to them in parables? And of course, them is the crowds, the crowds of people. And he answers and says to them, because it has been given to you, you the apostles, to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. So the meaning behind the parables are not for the general public. Yeshua speaking to the general public in parables, and some people will figure it out and some won't, but the actual plain spoken meaning of the parables is intended only for the apostles. And in fact, just before he gives this um, explanation in Matthew 3.37, just a few verses before that, the author of the book of Matthew points out that Yeshua said all this information to the crowd in parables, and he did not speak to them without a parable. So he wouldn't speak to the general public without a parable. So twice in Matthew 13, the author makes the point that Yeshua is not sharing the secrets of the kingdom with the general public, and then he gives the apostles some private information in a private conversation where he interprets one of the parables, and then the apostles turn around and write that in the gospel and share it with the general public, the very people that Yeshua is purposefully not sharing the meaning of the parables with and to me it just doesn't seem like that's something that the apostles would do so i'm inclined to believe that this parable of the wheat and the tares is actually about the scripture or about the the word itself the word of yah and in a number of parables in matthew 13 Specifically, the parable of the sower is in Matthew 13 also, and of course in that parable the, the seed represents the, um, the message of the kingdom. So it would make sense that the seed in this parable also represents the message of the kingdom. And we can even see that in the homilies when Kepha is talking about Yeshua's statement that until heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or tittle shall pass from the Torah until all be fulfilled. And Kepha says that since then, while the heaven and the earth still stand, sacrifices have passed away in kingdoms and prophecies and such like, as not being ordinances of Elohim. Hence, therefore, he says, every plant which the Heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up. So, again, here we see that the... Um, The, the plants that were planted by the Heavenly Father would be the true doctrine as opposed to things that are not commandments of Elohim, which are the tares. So this interpretation given by Kepha lines up with my interpretation of the wheat and the tares, that the plants which the Father did not plant were the false ordinances. But needless to say, because I'm not advocating ripping pages out of their Bible, this is really just a straw man argument, and there's probably really no point further in dealing with that statement. So now we'll look at this. You're just picking and choosing what to believe. Well, I agree. I am picking and choosing what to believe. But I wouldn't phrase it as picking and choosing. I would use this other word, discern. I'm discerning what to believe. So if we look at the definition of discern, because honestly, I don't know anyone that advocates reading scripture without discernment. So if we look at the meaning of discernment, definition number two is to distinguish mentally, to recognize as distinct or different, and to discriminate. And that's what I'm doing. I'm discriminating between truth and falsehood, I'm discerning what to believe and what not to believe. So what this is, statement is really saying is they're not saying you're just picking and choosing what to believe. They're saying you're discerning what to believe, and I wholeheartedly agree with that. I am discerning what to believe. I am picking and choosing because I believe that's what Yeshua has commanded us to do. I believe it's what Kepha taught us that we had to do. In the Nazarene Acts, 
book 1, chapter 16, he says that it's impossible to get knowledge of divine and ageless things unless one learns of the true prophet. Which wouldn't make sense if all scripture was infallible because it wouldn't be impossible. If the infallibility of scripture were true, we could just open the Bible to get all knowledge. But Kepha says it's impossible without knowledge of Yeshua. He goes on to say, I may be able to expound to you, he's speaking to Clement, the method of our faith without any distraction, and the order continuously according to the tradition of the true prophet who alone knows time past as it was, the present as it is, and the future as it will be. Now, Kepha says elsewhere that the other prophets that he refers to as men or prophets born of women, um, that they... They're shown the future. They're they're given foreknowledge, but it's like looking through fog or looking through uh, something difficult to discern. They're not given the clear, true picture that Yeshua is the only one who had the clear picture of of the past, present, and future. And so such things were indeed plainly spoken by him, but are not plainly written. So let me read that again. Such things were indeed plainly spoken by him, but are not plainly written. So much so that when they are read, they cannot be understood without an expounder on account of the sin that has grown up with men, as I said before. Therefore, I will explain all things to you that in those things that are written, you may clearly perceive what is the mind of the Torah giver. And this is what I believe is the point, is that We study the Torah, we study the writings of Kepha, we study the writings of the other apostles that gave us insight into the teachings of Yeshua. You know, if we had an actual written document from Yeshua himself, then that's where we would go to learn truth, but we don't have that. So the next best thing is the writings from the apostles, or in the case of the Nazarene Acts, Kepha's scribe Clement. But the point is, is that we want to get to the point that we can clearly perceive what is the mind of the Torah giver. That way, if we understood the mind of the Torah giver, then we wouldn't have to bicker and squabble over individual texts. We could take the knowledge and the understanding and the relationship we have with the Torah giver and with our Father to know whether something's true or false. Because if we know our Father, and we know our Heavenly Father is against killing and death and destruction, then we should know that He would be against slaughtering an animal in a form of worship to Him, as an example. And people get so wrapped up in individual verses, and and what, what word was this in the original Hebrew? What word was that in the original Greek? And I think that at times we lose sight of what the bigger picture is. And if these texts have truth mingled with falsehood, and if we don't understand the mind of the Torah giver, we can get lost in the false texts. Again, there's this saying that is attributed to Yeshua that is quoted by many church fathers. Be ye prudent money changers. And Kepha says that the reason that Yeshua made this statement was to tell us that we need to be able to understand the truth from falsehood in the Scripture. Because as a prudent money changer, you have to know counterfeit money from real money. And in the same way, we need to know the counterfeit word from the real word. So again, we are commanded to discern. So if, as the statement says, you're just discerning what to believe, or you're just picking and choosing what to believe, well, of course I am. Because that's what we're told to do. I'm fulfilling the commandments that are given by Yeshua. Kepha goes on to say, We do not wish to say in public that these chapters are added to the Bible, since we should thereby perplex the unlearned multitude and so accomplish the purpose of the wicked Simon. Now, do you notice that this kind of sounds a lot like Matthew 13? Yeshua had certain truths that he did not want to say in public. So he spoke to the multitude in parables. Kepha's again saying we don't wish to say this in public. Which, 
again, this is another reason that I think the parable of the wheat and the tares is about the falsehoods added to Scripture. Because it would then show that Kepha and Yeshua are both being hesitant about sharing this fact or this understanding with the multitude. And in the same way that we are to emulate Yeshua, now you hear, have here Kepha emulating Yeshua. Yeshua didn't want to speak in public about the additions to Scripture, so he spoke in parables. And here Kepha's telling you why. Because they, and we're at the, the part highlighted in green, they, not having yet the power of discerning, would flee from us as impious, or as if not only the blasphemous chapters were false, they would even withdraw from the word. Well, now look what's happened. We've just run into the third statement. You're going to end up rejecting the whole Bible. And you can see that that in itself is also reflected here in the words of Kepha. So now we're starting to kind of come to an understanding or an unveiling of what it is that is really the issue behind the four statements we started with. The people saying this are those who are not yet having the power of discerning. And because they don't have the power of discerning yet, they are in danger of withdrawing from the word if they start to accept the things that I'm speaking about as being true. And that's why they end up saying things like, you're going to end up rejecting the whole Bible because they are projecting their own fear upon me. They're trying to say that, that I'm going to react the same way they would. And now, to be honest with you, it's not that, that I've got some kind of superior understanding to them or anything like that. It's not like this power of discerning descended upon me like a dove. It is just that I read the words of Kepha, I studied the Nazarene Acts, I studied the homilies, I then took it back to Scripture, to the New Testament, and I compared it to Yeshua's words in the Gospels. Every time there's a reference from Kepha where he quoted Yeshua from the book of Matthew, then I went back to the book of Matthew and saw what the context was. And the things that Kepha says in the Nazarene Acts and the homilies lines up with what Yeshua was saying. It's just it's giving you the story behind the story. It's filling in the blanks of what Yeshua meant. So that's where that power of discerning comes from. And many people have written to me and said, you know, when I first started listening to the things you talk about on your channel, it didn't make sense to me. I thought it was crazy. But then when I kind of stuck around for a little while and understood where you were coming from and understood why you were saying the things that you did, it, it all began to click. And now... Now it makes sense to me. Now I'm no longer scared of, of where this is all going to lead. So those people, they now have the power of discerning. So typically, if somebody comes to me and they have these, these statements, essentially what that means is they just don't yet have the power of discerning. And it's because they haven't taken the time to study the writings of Kepha. So now we've dealt with those two statements, and we're down to just, you just throw, what, throw out whatever doesn't fit your theology. Well, again, I'm not arguing that this is false. I, I do throw out what doesn't fit my theology, but it's not, it's not really my theology. It's what is taught by Kepha and Yeshua. I believe that this is what Yeshua was talking about in John 5, where he says, you, you search the scriptures because you think you possess everlasting life in them, but you do not desire to come to me in order to possess life. And I've spoken about this before, and I've compared it to, if you're using a map to find your way, generally what you would do is you would, you're preparing for the journey, you'd take the map out, and you would study the map, and plot out the course you're going to take and then you stick the map in your back pocket and you begin walking towards your destination and you're not using the map as you walk you're watching the trail or you're watching the road looking out for obstacles and so you're you're making your journey from your starting point to your destination now, if you get lost along the way, then you may pull the map back out and reread the map to make sure you didn't misunderstand something. 
Or if you come to a fork in the road, you may consult with the map, but you're not going to be walking down the trail holding the map up in front of your face to where you can't see the trail and just trying to turn whenever you should be coming to a twist or a turn in the trail because, well, I mean, there, there could be tree branches laying across the trail. There could be obstacles there. There could be people in your way. So you don't actually use the map to replace your eyes. And I think a lot of people do that. They, they use the Bible to replace the Holy Spirit. You know, Yeshua didn't say he was going to send us a Bible to lead us on, into all truth. He said he was going to send the Holy Spirit to do that. Furthermore, Yeshua says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And I believe that this is just Yeshua rephrasing what Kepha said that we read earlier, that it's impossible to understand eternal things unless you learn them from the prophet of truth. And I'm, I'm taking Yeshua's words to mean that the scripture was so corrupted by his day that without the understanding of the true prophet, that you wouldn't be able to find your way to the Father. And so that's why Yeshua was making this statement. Homily 16.10 says, For the scriptures lie before each one like many diverse types. Each one then has his own disposition like wax. In examining the scriptures and finding everything in them, he molds his idea of Elohim according to his wish, laying upon them, as I have said, his own disposition, which is like wax. Since then, each one finds the scriptures what each one finds in the scriptures, whatever opinion he wishes to have in regards to Elohim. For this reason, he, Simon, molds from them the forms of many gods, while we molded from the form of him who truly exists, coming to the knowledge of the truth, of the true type from our own shape. So what Kepha is saying here is he's pointing out that People can find whatever they want to believe in Scripture. People used to use Scripture to justify things such as slavery or murder. I've heard people use Scripture to justify stealing. And when we read the Scripture that way, the Scripture is written in such a way where you can find whatever opinion you want. In the homilies, Simon Magus uses the scripture itself to prove, and I put it prove in your know, air quotes, but he uses the scriptures to prove that there are multiple gods. When Kepha uses the scripture to prove that there's one God. So you can literally find whatever you want by reading your own understanding into scripture. Now, People accuse me of reading my own understanding into Scripture, but in reality, I'm just reading into Scripture what Kepha and Yeshua tell me. Kepha says, For our commission is not to speak, but to teach those things, and from them to show how every one of them rests upon truth. Nor again are we permitted to speak anything of our own, for we are sent. And of necessity, he, he who is sent delivers the message as he has been ordered and sets forth the will of the sender. So Yeshua, so Yeshua sent Kepha. So because Kepha was sent, it was of necessity that Kepha, who is sent, delivers the message as he has been ordered and sets forth the will of the sender who was Yeshua. For if I should speak anything different from what he, Yeshua, who sent me and joined me, I should be a false apostle, not saying what I am commanded to say, but what seems good to myself. So, Kepha is making the point here is that whatever he's teaching us is what, Ke uh, is what Yeshua taught him. Whatever Kepha was teaching is what Yeshua taught. It wasn't his opinion. And the things that I teach on my channel is not my own opinion. I, in fact, if, if I'm sharing my own opinion, I make sure I tell you that it, this is just what I think. It's not, it may not be correct. And that's one reason I always try to put the reference and I always try to put the source text up on the screen so you can look it up for yourself and see if 
I'm telling the truth or not. So if I'm really just throwing out whatever doesn't fit my theology, then it would be contrary to what Kepha teaches. And Kepha gives us some rules of thumb to know what's true and what's false in Scripture. The first rule of thumb is that everything that's spoken or written against Elohim is false. Rule number two is whatever sayings of the Scripture are in harmony with the creation that was made by him are true, but whatever are contrary to it are false. Now, this second statement is interesting because if the Scripture is supposed to be the word of Yah and the creation was created by the word of Yah, then essentially the creation is the word of God as well as the scriptures are supposed to be the word of God. And the word of Yah, the word of God, cannot contradict itself. So I think that's where the logic of the second rule of thumb comes from. So for instance, there are a number of animals and creatures in creation that are herbivores, and there's a number of creatures that are carnivores. And then there's this third group called omnivores. Now, the thing about omnivores is, is what they are, is they're really carnivores that can also eat some plants. Your dog is an omnivore. He's not a carnivore. And omnivores are bit, are built and made like carnivores. They're not built and made like herbivores. And these two different groups of people, like you can, so therefore I group omnivores with carnivores because they're built like carnivores. So you've got herbivores and you've got carnivores. Each one of these two different types of creatures are made with a certain build. There's, there's certain common characteristics they have. There's the same kind of digestive system in all herbivores. There's a type of a specific type of jaw that herbivores have. And then there's a certain type of digestive system, a certain type of jaw that carnivores have. Human beings are built like herbivores. We are built like all herbivores. We've got a very long digestive tract. We've got a specific type of jaw that allows us to be able to to grind with our teeth instead of a hinged jaw like carnivores have that only opens and closes. Um, so if a human being is made the same way as herbivores are, and the creation reflects that, then that should tell us that we were designed to be herbivores because all the other herbivores are built and made the same way. We're not made to eat meat. We are not physiologically designed to eat meat. In fact, we don't even have the instinct to eat meat. If you take a three-year-old kid and you hand him a bunny rabbit and an apple, what's the kid going to eat? Is he going to eat the bunny rabbit? In fact, if you give the kid, if you give a, a little kid a puppy to play with, do you ever have to worry that the kid's going to get out of, out of control and just eat the puppy? No, because it's not in our nature to eat things. It's not a natural instinct that we have as human beings to go out and, and slay an animal and eat it. It's something that we learn. In fact, the meat itself is not even appetizing unless it's cooked. Again, it, it just shows that we're not carnivores. We're not omnivores. We're herbivores. So... For more information about that, about this examples of how we can tell the truth from falsehood, Kepha gives us a number of examples in homilies 2, chapters 40 through 50. So he tells us, for instance, you know, if you if the scriptures say that Yahuwah lies, then who, from where do we get truth? If they say that he's uh, bloodthirsty, then then who is loving and and nurturing? And so he goes through a, a number of different negative things that are said about the Creator and then refutes them through just really common sense. I mean, do we really want to serve a Creator that is bloodthirsty and loves the smell of burning flesh? Because if 
if that's the nature of the creator, then how do we know that he's not going to want to see our bloodshed or to smell our flesh burning? It's outside of the nature of the creator to think that he loves death and destruction. And that's really the point that Kepha makes. So basically, it's not that I throw out whatever doesn't fit my theology. It's that everything I throw out is based upon the instruction of Yeshua via Kiefer. And this is done by many Christians already. I mean, it's not that I'm the only one that does it. Many doctrines such as polygamy, Sunday worship, alcohol. I mean, um, all through the scripture you see polygamy practice. But I don't know a single... Christian denomination that supports polygamy. In fact, I've heard, heard one guy say that it's completely unbiblical. Well, <laughs> maybe, but it's all through the Bible. And I don't see how it could be unbiblical. Sunday worship, I mean, it's, it's not in the Bible at all. And there's groups like the Baptists that believe that alcohol is expressly forbidden. And yet, even in the New Testament, we see Yeshua and his disciples drinking wine. The difference is is that people get upset about the vegetarian diet because some of them love meat more than their creator. And yes, I did go there. And it's true. Believe me, I've had the conversations with people. I've seen the, the anger and the rage that comes over people when you talk about this. There's no other conclusion to come to. Some people love meat, love the taste of meat more than they love their creator. Period. Is the truth. So, in Luke 6, 46, the, one of the most frightening verses in all the Bible, why do you call me Master, Master, and don't do what I say? Yeshua's instructions are given by Kepha. It's just most people choose to reject it because they don't want to make the change. They don't want to take them seriously. But again, and I'm going to end this teaching the same way I have the last five. Kepha says, while I teach the things that pertain to salvation, if anyone refuses to receive them and strives to resist them with a mind occupied by evil opinions, he will have the cause of his perishing not from us, but from himself. And impious men overlooking the multitudes of things that are spoken in the scriptures for Elohim and looking at those that are spoken against him gladly bring these forward. And thus the hearers, by reason of ignorance, believing the things against, become outcasts from his kingdom. This is not something I'm saying. This is something that Kepha says. I'm just reading the words that he said. If you reject the words that Kepha says, then you are in danger of becoming outcast from the kingdom. And the reason is because Yeshua said to one person and one person only, I give you the keys to the reign of heavens. And whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loosen on earth shall having been loosened in heaven. He spoke those words to Simon Peter. And we have Kepha's teachings and instructions preserved for us in the homilies and the recognitions. This isn't me saying that. That's Yeshua saying that. So you can choose to accept it or you can choose to reject it. But rejecting it, you're doing so at your own peril. So I thank you for listening. I pray that this has been a blessing for you. And I bid you a Shabbat Shalom and good day.